History is written by the victors, a sentence once made famous by British Prime Minister Winston Churchill after the Allied victory in the Second World War. The quote has inspired many over the years and even today the internet is still full of inspirational pictures of this quote attributed to Churchill, until you realize that a similar phrase was once said by infamous Nazi Hermann Göring during the Nuremberg trials in 1946 and that Churchill actually probably never even said the phrase. But are people falsely attributing the phrase to Churchill while actually quoting a Nazi? Well, probably not, because a document written by an unnamed writer was found describing Robespierre's defeat in the French Revolution with a similar phrase as well. So who did write it then? I guess we'll never really know, because even earlier versions of the quote were found in French and Italian documents. Yet up until today the phrase has always been linked to Churchill and it will probably stay that way, meaning that there is a form of truth to the phrase. But in reality, history isn't necessarily written by the victors, nor is it written by the defeated. But the people who are actually documenting history, are they even telling the truth? Can we blatantly believe everything just because the creator says it's historically accurate? In this video series I'm trying to find out how video games can be used as an educational tool. In my last video I've discussed how video games can be used to learn more about climate change and luckily history is not an unknown subject within video games either. Some developers even promoted their games by saying historical accuracy was an important part of development. Some video games might actually be completely accurate while others take their own spin on real life events. Well, let's see how history is represented in video games, if it actually really is historically accurate and if it can help you to learn a thing or two about the past and the present. But first of all... This video contains a lot of spoilers for a lot of games, so beware of that. Second of all, I am not a historian. This whole video is based on the research that I did, which, just like the sources I used, could still contain faults. If you hear anything that might be wrong in this video, please let me know in the comment section. And of course, whether a game is historically accurate or not has nothing to do with if it's a good or a bad game. I'm looking at you, Wolfenstein. Nazi skull. Since history is such a complex and extensive subject, I'm not going to be able to cover everything in one video. That's why I'm going to split it up into three parts. And in order to make the whole subject as clear as possible, I'm using a method which is the standard for teaching history in my home country, the Netherlands. Here, history is taught by the way of the 10 time periods, thought up by the Committee on Historical and Social Education led by Dutch historian and professor Piet de Roy. These 10 time periods each describe a single unique period within human documented history. In this video I'm going to use these 10 time periods in order to create a bit more structure in this story. Starting off with this first period, better known as the prehistoric period. This is often seen as the period with the earliest signs of human societies. The year it starts isn't known, but it runs until around 3000 BC. But video games don't necessarily start with human history. In fact, 2020's Ancestors the Humankind Odyssey takes place in the Miocene Epoch, roughly 10 to 2 million years ago. Rather than being the first human, the player is actually a primate in this game and is tasked with adapting to the harsh environment that will eventually become Africa. The game can be seen as evolution in a nutshell. Where evolution takes years or even centuries in real life, the player learns new skills like using two hands, building weapons and walking on two legs in a fraction of that time. This is, however, very accurately portrayed. The game's director, Patrice Desilet, said that the developers avoided depictions of this era in pop culture and looked at real primate behavior in order to reenact this as accurately as possible. Fast forward a few million years and these primates have evolved to the humans as we know them today. However, society still have a long way to go to get where we are today. Far Cry Primal is set around 10,000 BC and the game portrays these early humans as hunter-gatherers during the Mesolithic era. The game gets a lot of things right. These small groups of early humans living together in very small villages, hunting animals like mammoths and being hunted by saber-toothed tigers. Of course it's all a bit dramatized, but it's a fairly accurate representation of early human life. However, this game is a good example of something that will occur more and more during the course of history. Stereotypes. 
When thinking about prehistoric humans, you think about dumb cavemen who are barely smart enough to keep themselves alive because that's how they've been portrayed in the media in more recent years. It happens a lot that popular media shapes a certain time period to be something that it just wasn't for the sake of entertainment. A game like Far Cry Primal is a good example of putting entertainment above historical accuracy. Riding wild animals into battle is a lot of fun, but it most likely didn't happen in real life. Apart from this focus on entertainment, the game just gets simple facts of the era wrong. The differences between the three tribes presented in the game is magnified even more by them being different species. Main protagonist Takar and his tribe the Wenja are Cro-Magnon humans. His enemies the Udam are cannibalistic Neanderthals and the Izila are anatomically modern humans. In reality, the only species of humans that were left around this time period were the anatomically modern humans. Where these early human societies are portrayed a lot more realistic is in the soon to be released game Ancient Cities. This top down city builder gives the player the tools to make these very first early human villages. Whereas the player starts with hunter gatherers, these people will steadily evolve into an agricultural society. A step that also happened in real life around the very fertile land of the river Nile. Which makes it not so surprising that when these societies are able to steadily produce food in these areas, they will stay and grow in these areas. Hence the start of the first urban societies in ancient Egypt, as portrayed in several different video games, including Builders of Egypt, Pharaoh and all of its expansions, and Immortal Cities, Children of the Nile. These games portray these early periods of civilization and the starting places of what will eventually become some of the earliest cities in history. The player has the ability to build their own cities in this game, so of course it will never be completely historically accurate, but the game gives the player a good idea of how these cities started, how they were built and how they functioned. Small villages turn into towns, towns into cities and cities into huge melting pots of culture, craft and trading. We'll be back for these Egyptian cities, but in the meantime societies start to pop up in several places around the world. In the second time period, known as the Age of Antiquity, cities start to thrive, cultures start to form, but conflicts start to emerge as well. Around 431 BC, Ancient Greece would be the stage for a conflict between the Delian League, led by Athens, and the Peloponnesian League, led by Sparta, during the Peloponnesian War, a war depicted in 2018's Assassin's Creed Odyssey. The Assassin's Creed games are known for their depiction of the battle between the Assassin's Brotherhood and the Templar Order, a battle we will see later in history and reality. In the games this battle is depicted as ongoing throughout history, and Assassin's Creed Odyssey depicts the origins of these factions as a battle between the Hidden Ones and the Order of the Ancients. This makes the story of these games of course completely fictional, yet it might surprise you how much of these games is actually based on real life. The war between Sparta and Athens is very real and most of the main characters you encounter in what historians claim to be the most historically accurate recreation of ancient Greece are all real as well. What Assassin's Creed Odyssey does very well is depicting the characteristics and personalities of these people based on what is known about them. Very important people from this time period like Spartan leader Leonidas, writer Herodotus and philosopher Pythagoras are all here. The game depicts this time period up to the smallest detail. So much even that the game includes a discovery tour. A tour which shows you around the map of the game and explains about real life aspects of the game. Of course there are some places where the game took some creative liberties for the sake of gameplay and entertainment. In real life the Spartan warriors were a wildly different army than the warriors from Athens. Where Athens had complete superiority over the seas because of their navy, the Spartans were known for being battle hardened foot soldiers. The game made the battlefield a bit more even by giving the Spartans a navy, which they didn't have in real life, and making skirmishes a bit more over the top for entertainment's sake. Staying with the Assassin's Creed franchise, 2017 brought us Assassin's Creed Origins. Set in 49 BC, the game follows main protagonist Bayek and his wife around the end of the reign of Pharaoh Ptolemy XII and his daughter Cleopatra's ascension to the throne. Bayek is a Magi, a sort of ancient Egyptian police force that, during the time that the game plays out, should have been gone already for about a thousand years. Apart from that, 
Just like Assassin's Creed Odyssey, this game is incredibly historically accurate. From the architecture to the clothing and weapons, a lot of time has been put into researching this time period. This research also included working together with French archaeologist Jean-Claude Golvin, known for his incredibly accurate sketches of ancient Egypt. In fact, his sketches were so accurate that the developers must have been shocked when they found out that one of the secret chambers they built in the Great Pyramid of Giza was actually discovered in real life shortly after the game's release. The game spends a lot of time on the complicated relationship between Cleopatra and famous Roman dictator Julius Caesar. Where the franchise recreated its real life characters very accurately in Assassin's Creed Odyssey, the same cannot be said about Origins. People like Cleopatra and Caesar were complicated people with very intricate personalities. Instead of showing the complexity of these characters, the game chooses to take one of their personality traits and focus mainly on these without spending much time on their other characteristic properties. Story-wise it's very logical the developers made this decision, but realistically these characters become a bit one-dimensional. This was the first time a discovery tour was included in an Assassin's Creed game, and it reveals some interesting design choices that give away another important part of history and its depiction. Censorship and changing values. Things that were deemed normal can change a lot during the course of history. Things that are seen as inappropriate today could be very normal 200 years ago. In a landscape where media is becoming more and more politically correct, things like inequality, inappropriate behavior and both of their depictions in the media are frowned upon by a lot of people. That's why the developers made some interesting choices while designing the game. For instance, nudity is completely absent in the game, even in artworks of that time. The Discovery Tour also explains why certain choices were made as far as the depiction of inequality goes. Here, both girls and boys are shown attending a class given by one of the rhetoricians of the era. The team made the choice to show both genders attending class within the context of the game world. Even though it is historically inaccurate, the team felt it was not necessary to prioritize historical sexism over inclusive gameplay. As is depicted in this game, the influence of the Roman Empire became more and more apparent. Therefore, Roman dictator Julius Caesar is still a very well-known person in history, mainly because of his demise and the story around it. On March 15th in the year 44 BC, Julius Caesar was stabbed to death by members of the Roman Senate. The assassination has been portrayed in several ways, including in video games. Origin shows Caesar in the hands of his trusted friend Brutus, whispering his last words. You too, my child. The assassination can also be seen in 2005 Shadow of Rome, in which Caesar says the famous words. Et tu, Brute. What Caesar actually said has never been confirmed. Yet modern media, just like these two games, portray the much more well-known version of the story as thought up by William Shakespeare in his famous play Julius Caesar in 1599. The Roman Empire is depicted a lot in video games, which is not strange since it once was the biggest empire in the world. The huge empire is depicted in many different ways within many different genres. From grand strategy games like Imperator Rome, which focus on the grander strategies of this empire, to games like Rome Total War, which depict the huge battles of the Roman armies. City builder games were not excluded from this time period, with games like the Caesar series. Where the Roman Empire was seen by many as an indestructible empire that would live on forever, cracks were starting to show around the end of the first century. Tyrannical emperors like Nero gradually destroyed the empire by means of bad leadership, greed and corruption. A period which is very stylistically depicted in Rise Son of Rome. The story begins in a Rome plagued by political corruption. Now the empire is reeling in chaos. The downfall of the Roman Empire saw its height in 395 and the empire split up into the Western Roman Empire and the Eastern Empire. Gradually the world changed into a new time period. Long known as the Dark Ages, the early Middle Ages start off with the Eastern Empire thriving, while the Western Empire will see its downfall. In Total War Attila, the player can play from the perspective of both of the Roman Empires. Whichever side you take, the goal is to create a huge empire and fend off the incoming threat of new barbarian societies like the Huns, hence the title character in this Total War game, Attila the Hun. 
The player can manage to undo the damages of the past years and even reunite the empires to become great once again, fending off the Huns in the process. In reality, the Hunnic Empire was becoming bigger, but the threat was short-lived. Yet the Western Empire still fell apart into several small states and kingdoms after the deposition of 14-year-old Emperor Romulus Augustulus. This would ignite the start of feudalism in Western Europe. Gradually, the Eastern Empire became more powerful and made its transition into the Byzantine Empire with its highly prosperous capital city of Constantinople. Though the empire would become smaller in size, it would keep existing all the way up until 1453. Meanwhile in the West, the only surviving aspect of the Western Roman Empire was the Catholic Church. The Church became one of the most influential parts of Western Europe, making the Pope pretty much the most powerful man in the West, and making most kingdoms in the West Christian around this time. However, it would take more than 300 years for the West to mostly reunite again. Even though the Frankish Empire was around since the 3rd century, it was Charles the Great who eventually united most of Western and Central Europe under the same rule. It became known as the Carolinian Empire. While these are the biggest empires in a period of 400 years in and around Europe, I'm not even scratching the surface of everything that happened during this period. Needless to say, the history surrounding everything that happens in Western Europe in this time period is incredibly complicated. Which doesn't make it that much of a surprise that the gameplay in a grand strategy game like Crusader Kings is very complicated as well. In this game you can see how Europe was split up in this part of history and the player is tasked with somehow creating order in all of this. For instance by recreating the earlier mentioned Carolinian Empire. But the player can also choose to conquer all of Europe. There are many theories on what eventually caused the split of the empire, mainly the fact that the empire was difficult to manage. It is also said that the spreading of the Christian faith in Europe and the pressure that Charles the Great put on the Danish caused the next important part in history, the Viking Age. It's actually kind of strange that in a period in which a lot happens in Europe, media mostly focuses on the Vikings. The way these Norsemen have been depicted in the past decades is far from factual. A good example of how stereotypical Vikings have been portrayed in recent history can be seen in 2016's For Honor. It's actually quite apparent how non-historical this game is when you look at the box cover for this game. Not only does it portray a battle between three factions that rarely or even never came close to each other, they also checked every stereotypical box for all three factions. The heavily stylized armor for the knight, which is of course not practical in battle. The swift and honorable samurai, which is, as far as this game is set in a real life time period, a bit early. And of course the bare chested, horned helmet wearing, axe wielding viking. Now this game can be forgiven for the simple fact that it didn't set out to be historically accurate. Even though it would have been interesting to see the factions in their historical accurate attire in my opinion. But in a game like Assassin's Creed Valhalla you might expect a bit more historical accuracy. Especially after the first two games we discussed in this video. Set in 872, Assassin's Creed Valhalla focuses on the great heathen army during their invasions on England. On the one hand this game is just as accurate as the others, in that the story is fictional but the world is portrayed pretty realistic. Especially London, which was at this point in time a ruin of the old Roman Empire, is portrayed very well. The Viking towns do a good job of portraying real life as well, being mostly built up of small wooden houses near the water, since the sea was of course an important part of their lives. There are however a few very important things to take into account. While we're long past the time of portraying vikings like bare chested brutes with horned helmets, the game still isn't really accurate in portraying their appearance. It's most likely still influenced by media like the television series Vikings. Thick leather armor, braided hair and lots of tattoos is still not completely in sync with reality, though it's a step in the right direction. Nowadays it's well known that vikings not only had feared male, but also female warriors, which could also function as diplomats within their societies. So it's not strange to see a lot of female Vikings in this game. However, it seems like just as in the other Assassin's Creed games, Valhalla chooses inclusion over historical accuracy. In this game we see Vikings of all kinds of nationalities and skin colors, which is good as far as gameplay and inclusion goes, but not based on reality. In fact, the game takes a lot of liberties with reality. The biggest one being the thing that the Vikings are most well known for. Raiding. 
The reason why the Vikings became so feared is the fact that they always chose a battle they know they could win. So seeing them charge into huge fortresses in this game is very entertaining, but not very realistic. In between the pretty well portrayed cities, we see castles that would in reality have been made around 500 years later. The same can be said for some weapons we see in the game. That is, if Vikings had even used them at all. The staved churches we can see in the game are of course a beautiful piece of architecture and an important part of Scandinavian culture. These are also several hundred years too early and it's kind of weird to see a staved church, which are Christian churches, in Asgard. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think the Norse gods were Christian. Religion as a whole seems to be a difficult matter in the game. The rituals the Vikings can be seen doing here are probably based more on series like Vikings as well, instead of on reality. But the most unrealistic portrayal comes in the form of DLC. In the expansion Wrath of the Druids, the player sets sail for Ireland, home of the Celts. However, the Celts we see in the game, portrayed as spooky forest people doing sacrificial rituals based on ancient Celtic polytheism, are first of all portrayed very stereotypical, and second of all, during this time period the Celts had been Catholic already for a few hundred years. People tend to forget that the Vikings lived over a period of three centuries and in comparison to other parts of history, we don't know that much about them. Assassin's Creed Valhalla is more a sort of stylized summary of what we know of Vikings instead of what they actually looked and lived like. Needless to say, Vikings are at this point probably still the most inaccurately portrayed people in modern media. Of course the Vikings weren't the only warriors in the world. Most kingdoms in Western Europe had their own armies. Especially England had to be well prepared for battle since the Vikings would try to invade England pretty often. These sorts of battles are portrayed pretty accurately in a game like a Total War Saga Thrones of Britannia, where players usually take control over the Vikings. In this game it's also possible to defend England from these invasions by playing as factions like Wessex, Mercia or Northumbria. Similar battles can be recreated in the heavily stylized online hack and slash games Chivalry 1 and 2 and the more recent Mordow. Though not historically accurate, these games give the player the opportunity to use many period accurate weapons and armors. Many of the battles in this time period were based on conquering more land or because of religious purposes. And religion definitely had been a very important part of pretty much every civilization at that point. In the early Middle Ages, Christianity spread throughout Western Europe and the Pope became one of the most powerful people on the continent. However, it wasn't the only religion in the world. Judaism was already a huge religion and the Islam was becoming just as big. But by order of the Pope, the Christian faith was supposed to spread out even more. On the one hand, this became the start of the late Middle Ages, a period in time which is often seen as a lighter period after the Dark Ages. On the other hand, it would be the start of bloody crusades and religious persecution. Many strategy games are based on this period in time. In the earlier mentioned Crusader King series, you can start in 1066 and fight yet again against the Norwegian invasion. While Crusader Kings focuses on grand strategy again, games like Medieval Total War focuses more on the battles, and games like Stronghold Crusader 1 and 2 focus more on the Crusades and the famous battles around them. Most of these games focus mainly on the most well-known Crusade, that being the Third Crusade from 1189 until 1192, a period in time which is also portrayed in yet another Assassin's Creed game. In fact, in the first Assassin's Creed game, 2007's Assassin's Creed is where the story of the fight between the Assassin's Brotherhood and the Templars is actually based on real life. The real life Hassashin, at that point led by Rashid ad-Din Sinan, who in the game is portrayed as Grandmaster Al Mualim, is set out to stop the Order of the Templar from getting hold of ancient artifacts which would grant them great powers. In real life the conflict between the two was based more on religion. In the game we can see several different characters from real life like King Richard, better known as Richard the Lionheart, William V from Montferrat, father of the soon-to-be King of Jerusalem, and Knights Templar Grandmaster Robert de Sable. 
Though, just like in every other Assassin's Creed game, a lot of liberties have been taken with the truth for gameplay and story purposes. But on the other hand, a lot of effort has been put into the attention to detail. For instance, developer Ubisoft Montreal was actually going to put the King of Jerusalem, Conrad van Montferrat, himself in the game. However, producer Jade Raymond later revealed that while their story needed him to die in 1191, he actually died in 1192. Instead, they opted to put his father William in the game, who was in fact in Acre around this time and did die in 1191. The way he is killed in the game is however inspired by the death of Conrad who was actually assassinated by the Hashashin. Meanwhile, on the other side of the world, trouble arose as well. Set in 1274, Ghost of Tsushima tells the story of feudal Japan and its battle against the Mongolians during the first Mongolian invasion of Japan. Where the Mongolian Empire is often known for its size and the man who made this possible, Mongolian leader Genghis Khan, this invasion occurred years after his death and was orchestrated by one of his siblings, Kublai Khan, Though he is referred to in this game, Ghost of Tsushima decided not to base the story on historical facts. Instead, developer Sucker Punch Productions opted not to focus on historical accuracy, but to pay homage to 1960s samurai films and hugely influential filmmakers like Akira Kurosawa. Because of this, the developers were not limited by historical facts. For instance, that the main character, Jin Sakai, is leader of the Sakai clan. A clan which wouldn't see its founding around 100 years later. Just like Assassin's Creed Valhalla did with Vikings, this game can be seen as a summary of all we know of samurai from a few centuries. Unfortunately, wars and the Crusades weren't the only thing in this time period that caused large-scale death. 1347 saw the start of the most deadly epidemic in human history, the plague. This period in time is portrayed in 2019's A Plague Tale Innocence. Though the game is not based on real life events apart from the war between England and France around this time, the game portrays the death and despair from this time period very gruesomely and detailed. On one hand you see the death brought by the war between England and France, on the other hand huge piles of dead citizens can be seen throughout the game, all caused by the Black Death. This game is one of the few examples which focuses on the story around the despair of these terrible events, instead of putting you on the front line of battle. Fast forward 55 years and we reach what many believe to be the most historically accurate game ever made. Kingdom Come Deliverance. Set in 1403 in the Kingdom Bohemia, the game depicts every single detail of this time period as accurately as possible. From the weapons, armor, clothing and architecture to the landscape and cultures. Even the soundtrack is made with sheet music from that time period. The developers did everything to make this game as accurate as they possibly could. Yet still the game came under fire shortly after release. The Kingdom Bohemia is located in the current Czech Republic, a region mostly made up of Caucasian people. While there is no proof of people from other nationalities living there in that time period, historians cannot rule out that there were no minorities at all in that period. And so the game came under fire for including only white people in the game. Arguments can be made for both sides of the discussion. The developers say that they went for historical accuracy, and since there is no documentation of minorities in that area, they didn't include them. People against this argument say that because the game is so historically accurate, and historians cannot rule out these minorities, the game should have included them. As the late Middle Ages slowly come to an end, so does this video. So far we've seen primates change into humans, we've seen the first societies form and grow, and we've even seen some of them come to an end already. Most video games do a pretty decent job of portraying a general representation of these time periods. Strategy games let you be the person to form and grow these first societies, or to wage war against others, while action games and RPGs put you in the middle of well-known conflicts or wars, but also show the everyday life of ancient societies. While some games try more to capture a general aesthetic of a time period or a certain society, others have incredible attention to detail and even try directly to be used as an educational tool. On the completely different side of the spectrum we've also already seen a lot of inconsistencies, historical facts being altered to be more enjoyable or to fit the story better, and even discussions arising over how ancient norms and values don't fit in today's societies anymore. Nudity, bigotry and the exclusion of people based on their race or gender are all very real and definitely were in history, 
but the developers and publishers rather avoid these sorts of subjects in their games rather than discuss them. But how will the rest of history be portrayed in video games? That's something we'll discuss in the next video, but for now, thanks for watching.